Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, this should be recording, of course. Um, I assume we'll be joined by a few more people over the next five minutes or so. But uh, I just have two or three quick announcements. And I always give you guys a chance to ask any urgent questions that are on the tip of your tongue, you know, before we start the uh, slides for today. And today we're going to cover uh, the uh, next section of Baroque art, and that's going to include a, uh, a sad, tragic incident that occurred between two of the most famous architects of the uh, Baroque era. And one you've heard of, probably Bernini. We talked about him last week, but we have another slide to start with of his statue, David, his version of David. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, go forward from there with some of the um, later Baroque paintings by women artists. This is the period when women artists in Europe finally started getting, some of them started getting some actual success in which they were considered to eat their male counterparts. And that wasn't very common as you know. Hello, Taylor, good, good timing. Uh, we didn't, we're just getting started. So the only other two things I wanna mention before we start the second section on Baroque art for, for, for the first slide is your papers are due one week from tonight. I sent everybody the cover sheet. I did just check my email, but I know some people haven't yet seen that. I sent it last night around six or something. So you should have that in your inbox. And I have it scheduled to be posted, the attachment. It's a one page PDF, right? Which you need to attach to your papers before you submit them in, of course, a digital PDF file. So hopefully it all comes to me in one file so it's easier to keep everything, keep track of everything, right? And when you submit them, remember it needs to go, I've been saying this, I said it in the email, so by now most of you should know, I'm gonna do the speaker view so you can see this more easily when I hold it up. The um, right way to label your PDFs when you send in any of your assignments, whether it's extra credit, a paper, or, or your exams. This is obviously art 1.2, right? It would apply to any of my classes, but obviously the class we're in today and for all your papers, you're going to do it this way. Art 1.2 and then no space, short paper number one, underline last name, comma, first name. That way they don't get mislaid or uh, there's no confusion on to which, you know, class I should uh, grade them for it's and, and so forth. But I do need to mention this happens every semester when, um, let's see, hang on. I think we've got somebody else wants to come over here. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. We're just, just starting. I'm just reminding people about the requirements for your papers, submitting your papers, which is that some people have different names that they put their on their work or even in their email handle than they registered under that causes mass confusion <laughs> because if it's even more than just a letter or two different if you use your middle name and not your last name or vice versa in other words what i'm saying please if you can all remember this if you enrolled with a certain name that might be different than the one that you know it'll be in your registration forms of course when you when you were enrolled you got confirmation right after you paid the fee for this three-year class obviously they have to send you confirmation so you you know and obviously you know you're in a class because you're sitting here on on the zoom you couldn't get into this meeting if you weren't enrolled so if you're if you're someone who might even possibly have a different name that you registered under or, or let's say the office of records and admissions chose to give you i don't know they've done that you know a different slightly different you know, first, last, middle, you know, some people have two middle names, it, it gets really complex. Please, please, please always use when you submit your papers with this as a tagline, the name you were registered under exactly the way it was on your registration. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sorry, go ahead. Somebody had a question. I just want to make sure we're going to start the first slide in about uh, 60 seconds, but this is your chance, unless there are several questions. I will stick around. I always do at the end to answer any questions after the last slide. All right, about, you know, 4.15 or so. All right. Did I hear someone ask a question? Anybody have, let me just ask one more time. Right now, any urgent questions about your papers? By now, you should be working on them. You should be writing them, not just researching them, because 
uh, that way you'll have time to check if you covered everything, you know, by using the list of nine, the handout I said everybody by now, you should, oh, I have nine elements of composition. And then the cover sheet I just sent is another kind of a checklist. You could just look down that list of things that you're going to get points for and see, am I missing something? Because if you are, you're going to miss, you know, a certain number of points for each missing item, obviously. And it's a pretty objective system. I didn't create it. Sarah Gill did, who wrote the uh, book, one of your two textbooks, Critic Sees. Uh, I think it's an excellent uh, way to be objective in grading uh, papers, because art is subjective. Obviously, it's up to someone's opinion, but there are some facts that everyone can find about any work of art that is, you know, well documented. And obviously, I told everyone, don't pick a work of art where you can't find three new sources. That wouldn't be good. Any other work you want doesn't matter. You should by now already have, I hope everyone's not only chosen that work, but has begun writing and, and done the research or at least nearly done. It, it just needs to be something that makes you uh, feel passionate or, or really motivated to want to know more and write about it. Anything you feel that way about, doesn't matter who the artist, the style, the period, the country, the culture, it's your choice. Anything except your own art. Okay, any last time now, any other questions anybody has, uh, which of course we can uh, revisit if you have some that you want to wait to ask at the end. All right, let's get started then. Uh, with uh, the first must know slide is David, one word. Uh, and that is uh, Michelangelo did one, you remember, and so did Donatello. But this is the third version. I'm going to move this out of the way. Now that jumped around. See, things do jump around on the internet. Okay, let's go back. This is the first must know. Now this slide is, I'll go ahead and tell you, so important that I'm not going to cut it from the study list. That's one of those cues I give people to take extra thorough notes and study them more carefully before the midterm. Okay, the title again, it's just one word, David. The uh, sculptor's name, the artist is Bernini. And I think you all know by now how to spell his name, but I'll spell it for you because we, we covered part of his work last week. Uh, B, or on Monday, B-E-R-N-I-N-I, -I -N -I. Bernini. 1623. Okay, so I already said Bernini. I think I mentioned this was, oh, here, here we go. Let me admit this person. Okay, we're just starting the first slide, so you didn't miss anything. So this is Bernini's David, 1623. Bernini was more famous as a sculptor. In fact, he was the most famous. This is literally just the first fact you should have in your notes. There's no debate over this. He was the most famous sculptor uh, since Michelangelo, of all the European sculptures, anyway, of course, we're talking about Western art now, and then we'll do the world art slides, of course, after the midterm. So in uh, European uh, history up through the Renaissance, uh, or you could even say late Renaissance, Baroque is, remember I said this on Monday, is sort of a, the last phase of Renaissance, but it has some differences, and you should have that in your notes if you were in class on Monday. If not, you want to watch that video when I post them on Friday, because I already gave the definition. I, I don't want to backtrack and repeat it. There are four elements or, or features of, of uh, Baroque art, whether they're painting, sculpture, or architecture. And so this is Baroque, you know, or late Renaissance. And I'll explain why as we go through the formal analysis. But first, Bernini, if you, if you weren't on the Monday Zoom class, he was the most famous sculptor since Michelangelo, and he also was an architect, but he wasn't as successful as an architect, and I will explain why that's true. Except for his colonnade, that's what we saw on Monday. It's on the syllabus, we already covered it, uh, and that would be the colonnade of St. Peter's. That, that was successful. Nobody would debate that. It's a beautiful structure that in braces people symbolically with these two rows of curved columns like arms around the worshipers who come to see the Pope, right? So that worked well, but he also had some failures as an architect and we'll get to those later. But as a sculptor, he had no equal. Nobody would debate that. This is one of his masterpieces. This work is considered one of the greatest works by any European sculptor and by Bernini, it, who was the most famous sculptor in Europe at that time. So what is this scene? We already know what the scene is. We covered this, right? It's David. But what's he doing here before 
the battle is what's happening. He's looking at Goliath. So what makes this Baroque uh, is one of the four features that make it Baroque. So it is part of the meaning, by the way, as well as some of the formal elements. So the first feature of this sculpture that marks it as Baroque is an unseen presence. Well, that should be really obvious. What is the unseen presence? Of course, Goliath. <laughs> we don't see Goliath. We know David is looking at Goliath. And that leads to the second feature of this sculpture that also marks it as Baroque style. A display of intense emotion. Well, look how intense he is in his firm expression and his intense look, you know, his focus, if you want to call it that, his determination. You can use any word of that kind that would express the emotion in his face. He is focused on concentrating. It's life or death. It's do or die. Either he's going to, with one chance, he's going to kill his enemy, the giant, right, uh, enemy soldier, Goliath, or he's going to be killed. So he, he has to be focused. So that intense uh, display rather of intense emotion shows up in his face, obviously. Now the bulbous rounded effect is in his hair. Now, I know most of you never <laughs> heard this, but this is my own term, you don't have to write it. I call this macaroni hair. <laughs> it's a Bernini style feature in which the hair, oh gosh, come on, I gotta get this to just so you can see. Yeah, there we go. The hair is not, this is one of the few things he, he uh, stylized, right? Isn't strictly realistic. Most people's hair doesn't look like that clumped, you know, European people's hair, whatever, clumped on their head in, in kind of, you know, bulbous shapes. That's literally what Baroque art is, is always got as bulbous shapes. Well, the same is true for the armor down below. See, he was given armor. This is a detail you don't need to write, but you can just say it's a bulbous detail. The helmet and the breastplate, by the way, that's what he rejected. He decided to fight without armor uh, to the death. Of course, one blow from his right slingshot killed Goliath. But before, he's got the slingshot here, obviously. So you could even say his muscles are rippling, you know, rippling muscles, whatever phrase you want to use. They're definitely bulging. There's another word. But that's part of that bulbous rounded look that Baroque art has. But it's mostly visible in the hair on all of Bernini's sculptures and here at the bottom on the armor there at his feet, several different pieces of armor there that he chose not to wear. Okay, and then what is the final uh, thing that Marx is, is uh, Baroque is an encrustation of ornamentation. Well, that's, I would say it's in his hair because it was just, you know, lines showing, you know, straight stringy hair, like, you know, European, uh, or, or in, in, in this case, uh, right, a Middle Eastern, right? It, he would have been Jewish, Israeli. Of course, that was at the time Israel was an ancient kingdom next to Egypt, right? In the Bible, it mentions that. So so his hair is, is, is overly or detailed. I want to say ornate, but detailed. But so is the slingshot. Look at that. And so is the armor. The armor, there we go, welcome. We're just doing the first slide now. This is David Bernini. And so the detailing is only in parts, but that's all it takes to qualify this as the fourth element of a all Baroque art. You see more uh, decorative detailing on some parts of all of Bernini sculpture. It's mostly noticeable in the hair and the face. And then uh, in this case, uh, down below, where the arm is. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning here, right? I mean, I already said some things about Bernini while I just repeated them. So that that's enough. If this were on and it has a fair chance of being on the midterm, you'd have more than six facts. Remember, that's all I asked for. We'll review about the midterm and how to write it. And it's an open book test, remember that. Um, an open note test. <clears throat> but the point is that you have, uh, you know, enough facts, at least six in each of the notes you're taking. I know because it was remembered, I said that the first night of class, but I don't think I've repeated. That's all I require to get a full points on each of the slide essay questions on the midterm and the final. So I always give you at least six facts. Okay, so the four of them I just gave you were the four features that mark this is broke and then all the things about Bernini. And of course, who was David? So we've covered the meaning uh, pretty, pretty thoroughly. Okay, then we have the fact of formal analysis now is the color. Well, it's a white marble, so it's clearly a neutral, right? You could say cool, and I wouldn't argue with you because against the wall behind him, we see 
you know, uh, warm colors on the doors, right? And and the, the, the walls, this is in a museum in Rome, by the way. So if you wanna say it appears cool compared to the warm background of that room, I wouldn't dispute that, you could make. But, but white by itself is considered neutral normally. Okay, and he's dynamic. Yeah, most uh, sculpture, uh, uh, Baroque, I'm sorry, Baroque sculpture is dynamic because he's in motion. Remember, it's before the battle, that's part of the meaning, where he's gathering his strength and looking at his enemy, right before he lets loose with his uh, stone from the slingshot. So that makes his body, you know, full of curved, right, or diagonal lines. I mean, even up through his hair, right? So there isn't really any straight lines that I see, except for the base. So everything else is dynamic. There are, I guess you could say three masses, him, then the armor, if you want to count that as, it's all lumped together here. And then the third largest would be, of course, the slingshot itself. Uh, for space, it's a life-size six foot tall statue of an adult man. So that's the real space, but the technique is only overlapping. Of course, his hands overlap the slingshot, his legs overlap the armor. His, uh, it's actually not a robe, it's a loincloth, but you call it what you want, clothing, what there is of it overlaps his body, of course. So that's the only technique for space, right? And then we have the rhythm, of course, all human bodies. By now, some of these things sh should start to become self-evident as you see slides because we've done them so many times, but I always give you at least six. That's what's the requirement, by the way, on the formal analysis is the same as to how many sentences or facts you need to write about the meaning that six sentences, six facts. And under formal analysis on the exams, you also only are required to at least describe six of the nine elements. If you do a good job, you get full credit, uh, but you can choose to do more if you want. So the rhythm is, you know, the feet, right? The hands, the arms, obviously on his face, though it's farther away. And if it's, if it's on the exam, you won't have the close up. It'll be this view. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of rhythm in any human body. Okay, and then we have um, balance. Well, he's standing, you know, mostly upright uh, on both legs. And uh, by definition, an intact human body is considered to be balanced left to right and top to bottom. Some people would say because the armor fills up more space uh, below his knees than his shoulders and head do. I don't see it that way. If you draw the line here, I think it's about equal. But you, you can be I will be flexible and you can decide if you think it's more unbalanced toward the bottom. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, texture, of course, the real smooth texture of the marble uh, is very obvious, but the Simeon texture is superb here on the armor, uh, even on the slingshot and his uh, face. And even if it's not very realistic texture on his hair, it's, it's stylized or exaggerated. It's still simulated texture. You know, obviously, it has some relationship to what hair might look like. Uh, so there's carved line, of course, everywhere to create that similar texture. And there's no technique for modeling. It's just the lighting from the museum. Okay, let's move on. Now we get to the tragedy of this, uh, today's lecture. Uh, and it's a, a rivalry that cost one of the two architects their life. And I don't know if anyone here has been to Rome. I think I asked that and nobody said they had, but if you ever go to Rome, this is one of the most famous plazas in the world. It's uh, Piazza Navona. You don't have to write that. I'm going to tell you in a minute the title of the slide, but just so you know where it is. Every movie ever filmed in Rome, there's at least one scene filmed in this plaza because it has these wonderful all-night cafes, several fountains, and one of the most beautiful churches in Italy. That's what we're going to see next, okay? So this is the next must-know. And it's the, this one I'm not cutting from the list either. The uh, third one down on the list for today. Well, actually for, yeah, right, for today, week five. Church of Sant Agnes, like Agnes, we would say in English. Agnes in Italian, they pronounce it. Church of Sant, uh, that's the uh, Italian spelling of Saint. S-A-N-T, second word, A-G-N-E-S-E. Church of Sant Agnes is the title. The architect's name is Borromini, B-O-R-R-O-M-I-N-I, -I, Borromini, 1657. So let's start with who was Borromini. 
he was an architect, not a sculptor or painter. He, he didn't try to be, you know, anything else but an architect. And he uh, was from a poor section of Switzerland of all places. He uh, walked, can you believe it? If you look at a map, that's a long way, hundreds of miles from Switzerland to Rome. So he could become an architect because that's where all the great architects were. Ber Bernini was already famous in Rome by then because of his sculpture, yes, but also the colonnades of uh, St. Peter's. So what happened when Borromini arrived in Rome, he, he got hired to be an assistant to Bernini. That's where the tragedy begins because he was more talented than his boss or however you want to write that, than his mentor. He learned some things from Bernini, but he was mostly self-taught. So I'll summarize this to keep it brief. Borromini was a self-taught architect who worked for several years in Rome. You know, his first commissions were under the, you know, employment. He was a, an assistant to Bernini. Bernini had hundreds of people working, but of course he did. He did hundreds of statues all over uh, Rome and other cities too. So he didn't do them all by himself, obviously. So he hired as one of his many, you say many assistants, a young man named Borromini who wanted to be an architect. So Borromini learned all of the things he needed to while working for Bernini. Then he set out on his own and this was his first major commission, this church. That's an important fact his first major commission. I don't know if he did small buildings before. This is a major church. So I'm showing you, these are my own slides, by the way. Let's take a look at what makes this church so different than any other. You can go around the world to any city that has Catholic churches from the 16 or 1700s. Well, they don't have to be Catholic, but they usually are cathedrals, let's see. Havana, Cuba, or Mexico City, uh, cities all over South America, and another, here we go. Let me let this person in. Whoops. <laughs> Welcome. We're just on the second slide here. This is the Church of Santa Agnes Boromini, the architect. It's the third one on your list for week five. Anyway, we're just saying that this church set, here's what the way to write it in a brief one or two sentences. Why is this church considered so important? It's just another church in Rome. There are thousands, but it's considered a, a seminal work of art. No question. It broke new ground, and I'll explain why and how in a minute. It was a prototype that was copied, isn't the right word, so say imitated or influential in cities all around the world. Even in Christian churches in Asia, I've seen churches with this style. You might at first say, well, what's so different about it? Well, here we go. This is what marks it as a unique or innovative, you can say, right? Or influential, any of those words, innovative or influential word. I just like to use the word seminal. That says it all in one word. It, it broke new ground and people were influenced by it all around the world for 200 years after this. Okay, even in the United States, there are some early Catholic cathedrals, like in Baltimore, there's a 220 year old cathedral that is very similar to this. Okay, so what did Borromini invent or create that was different than other Baroque churches before him? Two things. First of all, an undulating facade. This facade goes in and out. In fact, if we get up close to it, you can see it more easily. This is an old photo, obviously, uh, but it was under uh, restoration when I was in Rome. So I'll show you my close-ups, but this is the best full view. So if it's on the exam, this is the view you'll have. Because here we go, it goes in, right? I mean, out, in, out. You get the idea if you follow your eye along with the cursor and then deeply in, you know, it, concave, then it bulges out again. And then it, so this is the Baroque part. Yes, it's, it's bulbous but his his facades have undulating lines so you could just say undulating right you know how to spell that undulating facades no one else had done that if you look closely even where the clocks are see how that's rounded and curved and then goes in and back out so undulating facades is it's true the whole entire structure it's not just that one part if you look down here right out in out in out and then it curves inward and then it comes back out where the portico is right uh, and then goes in where the door is. You get the idea and then curves inward. Okay, so that's the first feature that he introduced, undulating facade. The other is a central dome flanked by two bell towers. Now that seems so obvious, but no one had done that before him, at least not on any famous churches. And I, I stood in Havana, Cuba. My first trip to Cuba is a beautiful 
city and looked at a 300 year old church from the early 1700s. And I said, oh my God, Borromini came to Cuba? No, <laughs> this was influential. What, 50 years later in a you know, country halfway around the world almost, right? In the Caribbean. So uh, it's Catholic cathedral of, well, it still is. It's still functioning as one even under a communist government, right? In Havana. So this was influenced uh, influential, this building all around the world because of these two new features. So again, a central, the second feature, central dome flanked by two uh, symmetrical bell towers. Symmetrical means identical, right? So everything is balanced. We'll do the formal in a minute. Okay, why did this cause a problem or did it lead to a rivalry, which it did, this is the last part of the meaning. It led to a bitter, and I would use that word, bitter rivalry between Bernini and Boromini, mostly on Bernini's side. Why? Because he passed out the commission to design this. You see, if you go back here, I'll go back to my first view. That's a narrow, that's not part of the church. Look how narrow this is. For a cathedral to fit into a space that small, Bernini said, you must be joking. No, those aren't that way. He just rejected it. The commission of the Catholic, whatever per, uh, bishop I'm sure it was, who came to him, said, well, we have this space on Paz and Nofono, and it's not very large, it's very narrow, but can you design a church? He said, get law. Yeah. In other words, he just rejected the whole concept. He said, you can't design a decent looking church in a space that small. Well, guess what? Yes, you can. Boromini showed him up, obviously. He didn't like that. So he already was uh, angry with his former student. But as if that wasn't enough, let's go back now to the tragedy that really started with St. Peter's and the colonnade. This is part of the meaning of that other slide. And the only way it makes sense is if I show you in comparison. When this was completed, nothing went wrong. This was I already covered this last uh, class, right? Perfectly designed, beautiful uh, piece of architecture. There's the arms of the church, right? Reaching out to embrace all the faithful. But what went wrong was Bernini got the idea, it was his idea too, not the Catholic Church. He didn't go and ask him. He told him, How, why don't I design some towers that are taller than the dome of St. Peter's? He wanted to outshine his ego and others involved. So he wanted to have 350 foot tall towers at each corner. Do you see them? Nope. Here's why they never, they were started to be constructed. Borromini was still working for him at the time. And he warned Bernini. So I'll summarize this one. He warned Bernini, don't build those towers there. The way you've designed them, they will collapse and kill people. And that's just what happened. One of the two towers was under construction. It was about halfway, about 150 feet or so. It collapsed and killed like two dozen workers. Luckily, not more, but that's a tragedy. You know? And of course, it ruined that commission for Bernini. Obviously, the church said, stop, don't. We're not going to finish that project, and they didn't pay him. So he had been warned publicly by his former assistant. You could see how that would have, you know, perhaps hurt his, you know, reputation and or, but whose fault was that? <laughs> not Borromini's. So he had it in for Borromini, that's my point, even before the real tragedy occurred. So once this church was completed, Borromini's reputation finally rose enough to rival or compete with Bernini. And that was what Bernini decided he had to stop. He couldn't stand being compared to someone who had once been an assistant for him. So let's finish up the formal elements and then I'll show you the other slide that summarizes the other next month. So I do want to show you what's inside the church and you all take notes now. Uh, well, let's do the formal analysis, get that out of the way. Whoops, that's this, that's this view because see from here you can't see it. Okay, so it's balanced. I already said that symmetrical, of course, that's true of most Renaissance and Baroque churches, but even more so because of the two bell towers. As far as the largest mass, I would say it's the dome combined with the drum. The drum is always the base and the dome combined together. If you count this as one mass, I would all the way up to the cupola, right? That cupola. That's probably the largest mass. But some people would say the facade below the towers. So if that's to you look like one mass, then you'd certainly say that was the largest mass, then the dome, and uh, then the two bell towers. For space, it's uh, a large domed church with about a hundred foot high dome. You're going to see what it looks like inside in just a minute. Okay, so that's all you have to write is there's a large open 
church space with a, a dome about 100 feet, reaches up to a height of about 100 feet up to that hoopla. The rhythm is obvious. The towers are identical, of course, as are uh, the doors and windows. Well, actually, the, yeah, there are doors, there's two, one, two, three doors, plenty of rhythm columns. I mean, everywhere you look, there is some carved line. It's hard to see here, though. So you could just say on this slide, it's mostly vis visual. I can say that word. There we go. Visual line because you see it around the edges where the sun, of course, creates the natural modeling. There's no technique for modeling. It's Baroque, so it's dynamic. I, I see very few straight lines. The only straight lines are the uh, flat columns. They're called pilasters. Everything else is rounded or curved, so it's almost entirely dynamic. Um, and then we have the color. This is a, not an accurate representation of the color. It's, a, it's an off-white color. And that's actually visible in this slide. See, they were cleaning it. I was there in 2000 for the 2000th anniversary of the birth of, you know, Jesus. Just I was invited by the tourism ministry of, uh, of Italy. It was kind of a nice trip. And so when I got into this church, I'll show you what it looks like inside. It was unique. It was being restored. They weren't letting people go inside unless you had special permission. And it's open now to everybody. It's a functioning church for almost 400 years. Okay, so then let's see. I, I think I've covered everything, right? Uh, rhythm, modeling, balance, um, texture. Oh, yeah, the texture is the real rough texture of stone and real smooth metal and glass in the doors and windows. Okay, so now you can rest to your hands for a minute. This is a statue or sculpture, a fountain sculpture in a fountain. The whole fountain was designed by Bernini. There is a myth, I used to believe it, that see what this statue is doing, this, this one statue here? Well, actually both of these are. They're reacting with disgust or dismay or, or uh, you know, revulsion to something in front of them. What's in front of them? That church. There are people who thought that Bernini designed this fountain at the same time the church was being built. And in order to get back at his former employee, uh, employee at his now rival right he made these statues act like they found the building in front of them revolting well that's a myth it's, it's not true i used to think that but what we can say is look what's inside this church it's amazing when i went up to the door of this building they weren't going to let me in and i was one of about 20 tourists uh but i had studied my italian this is a quick aside in case you're in a foreign country and you can just learn a few sentences of their language to ask permission right it's better to ask for permission than forgiveness that's the reverse of that stupid cliche it's really better to ask permission in a foreign country always. Of course, you'll be respecting the local culture and the people and their heritage. So I studied my Italian. I waited till all the other tourists walked away because they were told go away by the crew captain for the restoration workers. He said, you know, in Italian, he shouted, get away, we're not open, you know, blah, blah. So they left and I waited, knocked on the door again. In fact, I'll show you, these are the biggest <laughs> door. Yeah, here we go. I think it's, nope, it's not in there. It, it's a heavy, heavy, big, big brass ring on the door. Banged at it about three times. He came out, he was even angry because he know, I knew I was already in that group that he told to go away. So I said, scusi, scusi, signora, momento, momento. Um, yo soy un profesor de arquitectura uh, de Berkeley, California. And he suddenly said, oh, California. I love California, Disneyland, the Golden Gate Bridge. Come in, come in, <laughs> in English. He had spent his honeymoon in California, so he had a positive impression. So that was the open sesame, you know that phrase, some of it from Arabic uh, lore that allowed me to get into this. It was well worth it. This is such a beautiful space. I mean, look at the way that dome, it almost looks like the light of, the, he meant it to be this. At a certain time of the day, the sun just comes, you know, pouring through down to the floor below. And, and then he hired the contract or the uh, fresco of painters to paint these frescoes. So Borromini was a, was a superb architect, but unfortunately his rivalry cost his life. So here we go. The next must know is the Church of San Carlo. I'll spell that San, S-A-N, Carlo, C-A-R-L-O. I already spelled his name. I'll spell it again in case you just joined us. Borromini, B-O-R-R-O-M-I-N-I, -R -R -I, 1667. Okay, this is a black and white photo. Why am I not showing you a color photo? Because I couldn't find any slide library because it's almost impossible to get a full view of the building. These are my photos in color. This is the way it really looks. 
but there isn't really any way to stand far enough away because it's on the narrow. Here's the first fact. This is the narrowest lot of any church in Rome, possibly in all of Italy, but definitely the narrowest lot ever filled in with a church. Of course, if it was just an apartment building, that'd be no big deal. It's only 25 feet wide. That may sound wide to some people before and a church that's like, you know, a major structure that's got old hundreds of people. Once again, Bernini, here's why the Ravoli on this commission literally cost Bernini his life. And I'll say why in a minute. But the pre prelude to that was, again, it was offered to Bernini first. He was still the most famous architect in all of Europe, really. And he turned it down. He laughed even though that's recorded. He, he told the people who came to him, the bishop, whoever, the priest, and said, you're crazy. You can't design a church on a lot that narrow. Well, guess what? Yes, you can. <laughs> Borromini took the commission and created a minor masterpiece. This is study, this church, no exaggeration, and every architecture school in at least Europe and the United States. I, I know because I've talked to architecture graduates, at least if they take a class on the history of architecture that covers this period, this is considered a masterpiece. Why? First of all, because it is so narrow that he managed to fit a building this you know, important into such a narrow lot that was thought to be impossible, but also because of what's inside of it. So let's go inside to this. It had to have a dome. Now that's even more difficult or, or you know, challenging because domes need wide right? o o space to be open curved. Well, here's what he did. Now that's a detail the outside. The dome, he fit into this space in a way that makes it look much bigger than it is and much higher. When I went inside this church, I'd swear that I thought the dome was 60 feet above my head and it was a tour guide. He even asked people in English that was giving a tour. How high do you think that dome is? Oh, 50, 60, 70 feet. It's 35 feet. He created an optical illusion that is still fooling people today, 350 years later, in the narrowest possible space any church has ever designed, in, at least in Rome. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece for that reason, but also because of the, whoops, that went too far for it, because of the facade, which has allegorical sculpture. It's very Baroque. It has the undulating facade that I already described to you, right? It goes out in and then out again and in, of course. And so do the bell towers. There's another bell tower here that you can barely see the top of. I think it's just a little hint of it. And so it has the central dome. You just saw the dome right beneath there's the cupola below. That's the dome I just showed you. And then it has flanking symmetrical bell towers. So it fits that new style of Baroque that he created and in the narrow slot ever. So it's an amazing accomplishment. Okay, let's do a formal analysis. We'll do it quickly. Since it's a black and white slide, I'd give you guys a break on that if it's on the exam. You could just say, uh, but it is a warm color. It has, it's a pink stone the actual color, but if you say it looks neutral in this photo, of course I would dispute that if this is on the, I'm not saying I won't remove it, it may or may not. The last one I won't, right? The one from the plaza, the bigger one of uh, uh, Borromini, sorry. <laughs> so what happened? I didn't finish that. How did this cost him his life? Well, Borromini after this was really becoming in demand all over Italy, not just in Rome. And Bernini couldn't stand it. His jealousy got so intense that he blacklisted him. He blackballed him, I think is the phrase now. Uh, just like with, you know, writers during the Red Scare, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you in the 1950s, when if they had ever been involved in certain political groups, they would never be able to write again for Hollywood movies. Same thing happened, only this was an individual blackballing. He went to the Pope. The Pope wanted Bernini to keep designing fountains, sculptures, churches. And of course, he didn't want to offend Bernini. He'd known him, you know, for a long time. And he said, okay, what do you want? He said, don't ever hire him and make sure no one else in the city of Rome ever hires Bormini again. And of course, Bormini didn't know about this, but it just over, not overnight, but very soon after he finished his building, the bottom line is it did indirectly at least cost him his life because he didn't understand why he suddenly wasn't welcome in certain places. He wouldn't get people to contact him when he was trying to find new commissions. His clients dried up 
and disappeared, you know, all of his clientele, I should say, not clients themselves, his business, his work. He had to move into a tiny little apartment, you know, in, a, in an attic. And one day he literally had trouble paying for his you know, food and rent. One day his uh, maid or the maid that, you know, maybe the landlady, I don't know, somebody who found him in his apartment hung from the rafters of his own attic apartment. He'd committed suicide out of despair. And it's at least partly due to that nasty revenge that Bernini took against him by ruining his career. So that's a tragedy, like a Greek play. Okay, I already said this is balanced, right? Totally symmetrical as all Baroque churches are. It's got the rhythm of the columns, the statues, uh, right? And the two towers, of course. All right, and then for space, it's only 35 foot height. It's an open domed room with a 35 foot high ceiling. Uh, the color, as I always said, is a pink, warm pink. And then we have, um, it's, it's, there's nothing stable about it. I, I don't see anything stable, unless you count these. Well, the columns are rounded, so there really isn't anything stable. Maybe the base of the sculpture, that's about it. <laughs> uh, and of course, there's carved line to create the simulated texture on the sculptures. Uh, there's no painted or drawn line. The largest mass, that would be probably the facade, if you count it as one mass. And then it would be the dome and then the two towers. Okay, uh, I think, of, and the modeling is just the shadows from the sun, of course, and it uh, it's balanced, of course. All right, let's go to the next must know. By the way, this is the Trevi Fountain. Some of you know it's famous. If you throw three coins into the fountain, there's even a song and a movie and a play and a book with that title. I supposedly you'll guarantee to be returned to Rome sometime in your life. I have, I've done it, but I went to Rome by choice four times. It's such a beautiful city. So that's the fountain you may have heard of. It's the most famous fountain in Rome, of course. People throw coins in it, literally thousands of dollars worth of coins every day. <laughs> um, and um, I got a quick question. Yeah, it's it's been in many movies there is it from many, many movies. Okay, this is the next must know. Now this one's a really important one. I won't be cutting this one from the study list. Okay, so keep very thorough notes. This is uh, Maids of Honor. Maids, plural, of course, of honor, H-O-N-O-R. All right. The artist's name, the painter, is Velasquez, V E L A S. Q-U-E-Z, Velazquez, and the date is 1656. This is another one of those works of art that broke new ground. Uh, I would also call it a seminal work of art. And it was so influential that Picasso did a cubist version of it 300 years later in the early 20th century. Uh, he was inspired by it. Velazquez was a Spanish painter who was in the court. He was the court painter. In fact, that's the right way to say it. You know, he lived with the king in the, you know, not literally, but in the palace, which of course had hundreds of people living in it, obviously, servants and priests and in-laws and ministers and, you know, soldiers. Here, there he is. That's him in his own painting, which is one of the first, if not the first famous painting to include a self-portrait of the artist looking at us, the viewer. There was a precedent before, if you recall, I think from week before last, and that is Raphael was in his own portrait, but all you see is the corner of his face or the edge, just barely, you know, around the corner of the painting. This is a almost a full length portrait of him doing the painting. So an artist being portrayed as a self-portrait, creating the painting you're looking at that's a first, at least the first famous painting to do that. So that's one thing. But if that's all it was, we wouldn't be talking about this painting that much. Then he broke ground with a number of optical illusions. And this view of it does a pretty good job because if you stand in front of the actual painting, you'll see this, but most prints or slides of it, you can't tell this. So I chose this slide very specifically so you can see what I'm talking about. You see where the arrow is? That means that, that light there's a source of light coming from below, but it's a dark room. There are no torches. There are no candles. There's no source of light for that. Then we have the light hitting the, the faces of the figures here. That's the uh, you know, princess, 
right? In Spanish, princesa, right? She's a spoiled little thing. They actually know who she was, so I'm not exaggerating. She was quite spoiled. She had all these maids, you know, around her, taking care of her. She's getting ready for a party in the palace, of course. That, if that's all that was happening, we wouldn't be talking about this painting. Instead, what you have is the optical illusions that one on top of the other. They Once you know what you're looking at, it should surprise you because most people glance at this and just think they see the figures and maybe they notice him in his own painting. I think that's a little odd. Possibly they see one or two odd things like this little boy here kicking the dog. He was her spoiled younger brother, by the way. And then a dwarf who was uh, plucked off the street, probably homeless off the streets of Madrid. Of course, his palace is still there, it's in Madrid. Uh, and, and, and she was required to entertain these two children, royal children. Uh, you know, it's probably certainly better life than home being homeless, I suppose. So that's why she's there. And then these are the maids, the two maids who are attending the little princess. So that's the literal meaning. And then we have a priest and a nun. And we have a minister looking in on the scene. So those are the figures. That's, all, that's just the less important part of the meaning if you just want to know what's going on. But let's talk about the optical illusions. It's all about the way the light strikes this scene. You look closely, you see the light must be coming from behind us. Where else could it be coming from? It's directly on the face of the uh, little princess. So now let's take a closer look. I have a couple close-ups. That's actually how, how it looks. Well, this is a good view too, actually. In fact, I'll use it because you can see the same effect. Yeah, this is more accurate. The colors in here are more accurate. Uh, this is the one I was thinking of when I mentioned that. I think if you look at this, you can see the lights hitting her forehead, uh, her, her you know jacket or whatever you call it, the top of her dress. That, that style of dress, of course, isn't isn't worn anymore, but it's hitting the front of each of the uh, figures in, in the front. There we go. Ah, that's why I keep forgetting the slide library and included all kinds of superfluous views that I didn't ask for. But here we go. You see that there's no question the light's coming from behind us, the viewer. There's no question of that. But wait a minute. No, that isn't the case. If it was only coming from behind us as we stood at the end of this room, maybe walked into the room and happened onto this scene, that's what we're supposed to be. We just wandered into this room and, oh, that, see, they're getting ready for a party tonight. That, that would be the assumption correctly at first. The light has to be the source of the light is behind us, but that's not all. The light's also coming from the side through this window at a 90 degree angle from our behind us. That's impossible on the planet Earth. There's only one sun. And then the really uh, surprising details are the light coming from 180 degrees, exact opposite end of the room, shining on that door and on the stairs. That's physically impossible, again, on planet Earth with only one sun. And then if that's not enough, there must be a source of light which is not visible anywhere from the floor or below anyway, on the ceiling where you see light reflecting here. He was playing with us. Velasquez was experimenting and he was a genius in getting these unexpected details. But my favorite surprise is this one. There's the king and queen right, the mother and father of the two little bit, you know, children, looking in on their darlings. But wait a minute, if they're in the mirror, and we're standing here looking at these people in the room, where are we? We should be visible either in front of or behind the king and queen, right? So it's one illusion on top of another. There's like half a dozen optical tricks is a good word to use if you prefer that, or optical illusions that he's... Uh, managed to portray or capture, if you want to say that, in this painting that no one else had ever tried to do. So it's it's studied by painters all over the world. I, I watched a class of people. It's, it's in the museum in Madrid called the Prado. And uh, whole classes of painting students or art students, you know, who are studying painting, would, or even just sketching, would come in uh, while I was there for several hours back and forth. This, this has a whole wall to itself. And you could see that how many different groups every day pass through just to sketch or study this painting. It's that famous and that influential. Okay, so formal analysis. It is unbalanced toward the bottom, I would have to say. 
unless you count all of this, which you could say is solid and is the ceiling and these paintings on the upper wall as part of the mass, but because of the number of objects of the human figures below the middle, I would weight it, uh, call it weighted toward the bottom. And, and it is unbalanced, sorry, roughly, roughly balanced left and right because the painting, that's the very painting itself. And it is that big, by the way, it's a huge painting, um, balances out with the light coming through the window frame roughly. At least that's how most people would see it. Again, if you feel because the painting here is somewhat more noticeable than the window framing, and you think that makes it unbalanced or the left, I wouldn't dispute that. Okay, so then we have the rhythm, of course, of all the heads and arms and hands and legs. The semi texture is quite superb, except when we get to her uh, face. So let's do this. Uh, there is soft diffuse texture, not super strong on her hair and her forehead and the top, I think it's called the jacket, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> the top part of her dress anyway. And some painters have made the case, and I agree with them, that that is a four prototype 200 years before Impressionism was even thought of, was even tried in France. Of course, we'll get to that after the midterm. So you could say that is another advanced technique that he's introducing, but you know, it's hard to say why he did that. Uh, in any case, that's the only place where the modeling uh, and the cement texture are soft and diffused. Everything else is sharp and realistic on the hair, the clothing, and of course the room. Uh, it is mostly stable. Look carefully. I mean, because she's tilting up slightly, yes, but he's standing upright. She is. Uh, she is. The dog is at poor dog is at a right angle, right, basically horizontal, and the whole room is totally stable. It's mostly stable. I don't know how you break it down in mass. If you count the room as a so single mass and it's the largest space, then you could say the painting. And then you decide which figure looks the largest. It's, it's hard to say. Either him because he's the tallest or her because she has the widest dress. And you can see all of her uh, outfit here. Uh, one of the two maids. Okay, the lines are thin outlined on everything. And the colors are cool on um, her and the maid's dresses neutral on the painter and the dwarf's clothing, warm on the little boy, the dog, and of course the doorway. And uh, I would say kind of a mixture on the ceiling. Depends on if you see the ceiling is more brown or than green. Okay, that's, that is an important slide. So we wanna really carefully study that. Oh yeah, I forgot I have this view here. Look, you can see uh, this is a spoiled brat. <laughs> <laughs> the dog doesn't look too happy, does he? Uh, get your foot off my back. But of course, he probably got used to it by that time. All right, this is the first famous woman painter that we have covered in this class. We'll see quite a few more over the next several weeks. So here we have the next must know. Uh, this is Judith and the Maid Servant. Judith and the Maid Servant. Just like it sounds, Judith, of course, with a TH. The artist's name, her last name was Gentileschi, G-E-N-T-I-L-E-S-C-H-I, Gentileschi, 1625. Okay, so who was she? Okay, her name was Artemisia. There's a movie with just that is the title, Artemisia, just like it sounds, A-R-T-E-M-S-I-A, Artemisia, S-I-A. That's her first name. She became the most successful independent female painter, or you could just say female painter in Europe during her lifetime. She was one of the first famous female painters. It's all facts about the meaning now on this slide, of course. And one of the first famous independent women painters. There were women who had painted with, you know, a father or a brother or an uncle or somebody who sponsored them. But she was completely out on her own for very tragic reasons. <laughs> That is part of the meaning. When she was 15, her father was already a famous painter. He was commissioned by the Pope and, you know, I mean, really successful. You probably never heard of him, right? Forget his first name. <clears throat> she outshone him, obviously. But what happened, why, why she became more famous and, and didn't have anything to do with him on her own is because of how he handled the rape allegation uh, about her. He hired a tutor who was 40 when she was 15. And she later reported that he had raped her. So her father, instead of prosecuting, right, that 
Tudor, which, by the way, the guy was married with kids back in his home town. <laughs> I mean, more than scandalous. Obviously, it was illegal. Even back then, that was a heinous crime. Instead, he sent them both to the Inquisition, and they were both tortured, as if it was partly her fault, her own father. So she never spoke to him again. She was acquitted after being tortured because it was clear it wasn't her choice. And it, it, you know, obviously he was the, the, the perpetrator. So he was sent to prison for at least a few years. And she left home and never spoke to her father again. So that's how she became totally independent by choice. And she just was so talented that when she did paintings like this, uh, they were purchased by people with you know enough funds to, you know, she could survive. She actually had a very successful career uh, selling her paintings. Uh, some commissioned, some she did on her own, and then they were bought later by someone else, a collector. So she was a very successful independent woman painter, one of the first famous ones in Europe. This is a scene from the Bible where um, Judith, the daughter of the king of Israel, decides to sneak into the tent of the enemy king. You don't have to know his name. Uh, who is you know, attacking Israel. And so she decides on her own, without her father's knowledge, to sneak into his tent, get him drunk, and with her servant, right, because people would have traveled if they were you know, royalty, they always had some servant with them, and get him so drunk that I think he fell asleep anyway, just that he, he was a victim, therefore, of her uh, beheading. She beheaded him. And that's what we see here, his head. You see that down below it has just been severed. So she, in other words, won that battle without any fighting. I mean, once the army, the enemy army woke up in the morning and saw their own king was beheaded, they, they ran, you know, they, they left the battlefield. So she saved her people and her, you know, her, her family, her father and their, their kingdom. It's in the Bible. So this is a scene from the Bible where that is Judith, of course, and her servant. And she's noticing that someone's approaching the tent after they've just dimmed the did the deed of, but you know, of dissecting isn't the word of, um, right? Cutting off the head, decapitating, that's the word I was looking for, uh, the enemy king. And she's afraid of being caught. So she's showing apprehension. So this is a baroque, you see, everything in here is bulbous. I mean, her sleeves, you know, the robe, she, oh, I mean, sorry, dress that she's wearing, her uh, maid servant's headdress, the severed head of the enemy king, the tent the roof if you want to call that if there is a roof in a tent that's part of the fabric the t everything and then there's an incrustation ornamentation of all these objects on the table and then the clothing of course and uh, the decorative hair style she has there's, there's ornamentation here that is typically baroque the unseen present is an enemy soldier and the intense emotion is fear of course or apprehension is probably a better word but she did get away with it, according to the Bible. She wasn't caught. She got safely back to her father's palace. And the next day, they had their victory. The enemy soldiers ran away. Okay, so that's the whole meaning here. Uh, formal analysis. It is balanced with her in the middle. Even though she's leaning over this way, part of her body goes there. Then with the maidservant here, uh, I think if you draw a line here, it's, it's definitely roughly balanced left to right. And I would argue top to bottom because of this tent, the tent uh, fabric, I guess you can't call it a roof, right? Uh, that section there roughly balances out to me, top to bottom. Okay, and then we have the rhythm, of course, the arms, hands, legs, uh, the cement textures are super sharp. She was a master at that uh, on the, it uh, looks like a satin dress. And of course the cloth of the maids clothing and their skin, their hair, and so forth. Uh, same thing with the modeling, very strong, but here it's, it's uh, chiaroscuro, remember, when it's deep shadows on her arm because of the candlelight, and that's reflecting on her face. If you're curious, what's, what's that doing on her face? It's because her own hand, and obviously this candle is not the one creating it. There will be other candles in a tent that big. By the way, some people think that's a self-portrait of her. She was about that age when she so she already was independent at 16, that whole trial and everything and all that took several months. So she was around 16, she left home forever for good and already was doing paintings on her own by then. 
very talented woman. And anyway, the movie, you can watch it and get 10 points extra credit. Remember, it's Artemisia, A-R-T-E-M-I or E-S-I-A. It's her first name. Of course, you could also just, for extra credit, you could find an article about her. There are all kinds of articles and just send me the, you know, the, the screenshot of it. Uh, and that would be worth five points, of course. Okay, it's dynamic. I don't see anything stable. I don't see any straight line. Maybe the top of the table. Um, and the largest mass is her, then the maid servant, and then the, I'll call it the top of the tent or the back of the tent. Um, the color's warm, um, of course, the red and yellow of this fabric and their skin tones cool on the, her sleeves and the maid servant's clothing. Um, the line is thin on everything. Um, I already mentioned the modeling and texture, right? I think we've covered everything. Balance, rhythm, dynamic, stable. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, space, sorry. Overlapping and foreshortening. Foreshortening is on that table. And I would say somewhat on the shoulders of these two women. Okay, so we're gonna end right on time. Now the last must know artist is, is a really important one, but uh, this isn't the must know. Let's go to that. It's Rubens and it's the Garden of Love. Garden, just like it sounds, three words, Garden of Love. Rubens is R-U-B-E-N-S. And the date is 1638. So I'm going to start by telling you something about, this is for the meaning, you do want to take notes. I'm not going to cut this slide. This is the last one of which today, of course, it is our last slide for today's lecture, uh, that I'm saying about it, that it, it it's, it's very important uh, because Rubens was probably the most famous of all the Northern Baroque painters, meaning north of the Alps, north of Italy. Although many would say it's Rembrandt and I personally feel that, but he, he during his lifetime, Rembrandt was not as successful as Rubens. Oh, so let me tell you some things about Rubens and you should take notes because it's part of the meaning. That's a portrait of his uh, second wife. So Rubens, I, I said it just now, I'll repeat it though. It was the most successful and famous of all Northern Baroque painters. His work was in countries all over Western Europe. They were commissioned by kings, popes, bishops, you know, the Catholic church, wealthy collectors and royalty, all commissioned work from him because he was the most famous Northern Baroque painter. Of course, I don't have to say European because it's a European movement. Obviously, Baroque art is only, was only in Europe and a little bit in North America at that time, but not much of it was being done. So this is making him the most famous painter because he chose subjects that people really wanted to see paintings of. For instance, there's a scene from the Bible, the return of the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you know from the Spielberg movie, right? <laughs> it's... It was a real optic. We know it existed. What happened to it after the fall of Jerusalem? Nobody knows. I doubt that uh, his version of, of where it ended up in the end of that movie is accurate. But in any case, it's a scene from the Bible. And so, of course, these are all these characters are Jewish, uh, but it's part of the Bible. So it's, you know, Christians and Jews alike could find this painting interesting. Here we have baby angels up here. This isn't the must know, but it, it has all the basic elements of Baroque painting. But this particular uh, style of Baroque, his, I'm sorry, his style of Baroque included a combination of soft modeling. You see, if you look at it, soft, I took the slides from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, soft modeling, right, with bold outlines. You put those two together, no one had done that before. And you have a distinct look they're called Rubenesque style figures, plus the mythical feature, creatures around the outer edge or another one of his signature motifs. So I'll repeat that. Those are the two main signature motifs that he, uh, he had that you see in this painting. You know, around the outer edge or border, you see mythical creatures. See, they're even down here, these, these uh, cupids, right? Or baby angels, just say cherubs, right? And then also the soft modeling on the main figures with bold outline. And then finally, a swirling motion. All of his paintings have swirling motions or circles within circles. And that's visible when you get up close. Here's, I uh, showed you the big circle right around the edge. And then you have this group of the rabbis. And then finally, you get these four people's faces. And that forms an even tighter circle. So it's circles, you could say it that way, circles within circles. 
uh, one of his motifs. This is his painting of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. Rather gross and disgusting. It's meant to be. <laughs> and of course, this guy is especially grotesque. And then there's a drunken lion. And then this guy here. Yeah, and then her. She's obviously they're all just totally, you know, getting completely Votto. And that's an early student painting when he was studying painting. So he was already talented. So let's talk about the last must know now for today. What's happening here is a scene on his second wife's estate. He, he got lucky. It was part of the meaning of how and why he became so successful. Uh, he married well twice. <laughs> the first time he married to a wealthy woman who then he didn't have to worry, of course, about the, you know, the rent and food and all those things that many artists do literally have to always struggle for. He didn't have to, uh, but he was talented. So she promoted his work and then she died in childbirth. I think it was childbirth. Anyway, after they had two or three children and he grieved for, you know, I don't over a year. Then he met someone even wealthier and that's when this painting was done after he married his uh, second wife. He had become a widower, of course. And she even, of course, with even a greater fortune to support him was able to promote him even more. So it's not to denigrate his talent. He obviously was a very skilled painter. And he had these new techniques. So this has those three techniques. If it's on the uh, midterm, you'd want to mention here they are again. These though are actual cupids. They're not just baby angels. They're cupids and they're pushing people together to make them fall in love. That's of course why the title is the garden of love. And we see here couples about to, well, you could use the word hook up, I guess, if you want, fall in love or get, you know, involved, however you want, become intimate, know each other in the biblical sense, however you want to word that. Clearly, it's implied that they will get to know each other in an uh, intimate way. Uh, this is just the courtship part of it, or if you want to say flirtation part of that. Um, and this is on the, this was a structure on the estate of his wife's many, many acres she owned uh, in whatever city that was in. Um, this is in Belgium, by the way. Um, this is a mock ruin. Mock ruin literally are only wealthy people could afford them. They've been used since ancient times, even the Egyptians some, but certainly the Romans did them. And, and a lot of Victorian mansions have mock ruins on the grounds so if they have enough land. It, it was a common thing where you build a fake temple and then build it like it's halfway you know, ruined. So you could you know, show off whatever your knowledge of history and art and architecture. Obviously that's somebody who has money to, to spend and extra money to waste if you want to call it that. So this is a mock ruin on the grounds of his wife's estate, which is an indication of the wealth that he was lucky enough able to enjoy because of his second marriage. And then finally, we have the undulating effect that we mentioned where things form circles. If you do a line from this couple here, or, uh, below the dresses of all the ones standing and then up around the top of this guy's hat, and then these women's and mostly women's heads, and then there's another circle here, and then a tighter circle you see there in the middle. So that circle within a circle effect is very evident here. And then you have the soft, relatively soft modeling in at least some parts of it, uh, especially on their faces and uh, their, their uh, skin and yet strong or bold outlines. Okay, and then finally, this is so dynamic, this is the formal analysis uh, that'll take us right to where we should be. There, there are several things about this painting that aren't obvious. So I'm going to give you all nine elements. I think I almost always do, but usually I, I don't always count. So if I forget one, please just holler. Okay. All right. For space, we do have all the main techniques. This has atmospheric perspective. You see that in the trees and the grass in the distance. It has, there's no question of scientific perspective. The vanishing point would be behind this mock temple here. It's a mock temple or mock ruin, you could use either phrase, but there would be some kind of, he would have used the, you know, the diagonal lines here. So it has scientific perspective. And of course there's overlapping. There is foreshortening obvious on the temple, but even on some of the figures, the human figures on their shoulders. Uh, and then we have uh, diminishing size, of course. The human figures are smaller, the further back they are. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then we have the colors alternating warm, cool, cool, warm, warm. Cool, warm. Uh, that's that's common in lots of Renaissance, especially Baroque painting. So he didn't create that idea. Just draws your eye into it more when you have alternating warm and cool colors. I would say the sky is cool and the temple is neutral because it's almost an off-white, but some people see more brown in it. So 
be some more slight tan color. If you see that, then you could say it's slightly warm. Okay, I already mentioned that there's bold outline around the main figures, but here it's soft, even the outline on the mock temple, because he didn't want you to focus on that, but there is line, outline everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and some of it's thin, but around the main objects like this guy's body here, for instance, and these two people here, their faces, he's bold on the, the most important figures. It's dynamic. I don't see anything stable unless you count maybe the sides of the mock temple, possibly, but or maybe this tree, but even it's leaning over. So most of the figures, these two are standing upright, these two here, but then there's still some dynamic features on their clothing. So it's mostly dynamic. It is unbalanced toward the bottom, right? If you draw the line across here, obviously there's some empty space in the upper half um, and roughly balanced left to right, okay? The rhythm is pretty evident with the repeating shapes of the heads, arms, hands. You don't see too many legs here, but a few. And of course the mock temple creates a really strong rhythm as do the baby angels. And they have that soft modeling with a bold outline that you saw earlier. Now look, isn't that interesting? <laughs> what is that, a frog? I don't know, or some kind of a lizard in the fountain, right? Probably a real fountain that was on the grounds of his wife's estate that we know this actually was one of many such parties that his wife hosted for, of course, the well-to-do upper classes that they spent time with. All right, and then we have, let's see, uh, am I forgetting anything? Line, modeling, oh, the largest mass. That's hard to say. If you count this as one mass, I kind of would. This group of people all overlaps. Then you could say that's the largest mass that the people in the middle ground uh, or if you break it down by individual figures, then it's a little harder. Maybe the woman in the blue dress, because she's closer to us. Uh, and then possibly these two figures standing at the far uh, right. And, and yet others, people would say the temple, the mock temple. Uh, so maybe that's the largest mass. And then if you don't count this whole group as a single mass, you would just say, I guess, second largest would probably be the uh, woman standing at the far left. And then the two figures would be at the far right, be the largest, uh, third largest mass. Okay, I think I've covered all nine elements and we finished just right on time. Any questions anybody has about your papers, extra credit, or any of the slides we covered today? Uh, I got a quick question. So the whole thing with uh, Bernini and what's Bor his name? Yeah. Boronini. Boronini? Uh, yeah, that's right. How long did it take? for people to start appreciating his arts or like? Oh, that's a good question, yeah. Well, they did when he was not on the blacklist, you know, he wasn't being uh, uh, boycotted, you know, mm -hmm. silently, you know, ostracized because of Bernini's demanding the, uh, so, so during his lifetime, he was appreciated. After he died, I think his work was not forgotten, that's too strong, but, but you know, less, uh, admired than Bernini. So sometime in the late 20th century, historians began doing research. And I can tell you one, I know I don't like his work, but Frank Gehry, for whatever else, I, his buildings don't, they leave me cold. <laughs> I know he's the most famous architect in the world now, but I give him high marks for the fact that he admired Borromini's work for its originality. And he studied him when he was in, although his buildings, I'm talking about, of course, Frank Gehry's own buildings don't have it, bear any resemblance, of course. He's not trying to imitate Baroque architecture. Uh, so he's one that helped revive his reputation. But my favorite is Mario Botta. Mario Botta did the Museum of Modern Art, San Francisco. There's your extra 10 points, extra credit. They're having all kinds of new exhibits, including African art uh, that has never been shown, African-American art and African art. And of course, their permanent collection of 20th century painting. It's a, it's a good museum. That whole complex was designed by an Italian architect who came from the same part of Switzerland and moved to Italy. And I actually interviewed him over the phone once. He just, he wrote his thesis back about 40 years ago because Mario Bode has got to be in his 60s or early 70s. He's one of the most famous architects in the world today. And he admired him. So, so just say, to answer the question in short answer, sometime in the latter part of the 20th century, uh, architects uh, began to appreciate his work and 
and comment or promote it. And it now is a uh, thing that's required to study, at least in many, just say many architecture programs, like UC Berkeley uh, and uh, MIT and uh, the, the architecture schools in Europe. They're required to study his work because he was so creative. Yeah, so for a while he was not forgotten, but, but you know, underappreciated. And now he's getting his due. And he didn't know that he was blacklisted uh, I don't or, think he, he might have suspected. Well, he also was, some people say he was manic depressive. We don't know because he didn't have a way to test it. And that's what some historians who, who defend Bernini uh, and like his work better will say, oh, well, you can't blame his suicide on anything Bernini did because if he was manic depressive, he could have killed himself anyway. And there's some truth to that. But I see it as a little more nefarious. I mean, we know that Bernini tried to get him ostracized from all the possible, at least any major commissions in Rome after the completion of that church with the narrow dome, because he was jealous. And no question he was jealous. I mean, right? Bernini never designed any structure that collapsed. I'm sorry, Borromini, see, I'm doing it. Borromini's buildings never were in danger of collapsing. And obviously Bernini didn't listen to his, his under, you know, assistant there. If he had that, he might have not had that problem. And he didn't get any more Bernini again, didn't get any more major church commissions after that. He had some small buildings, but mostly he was a sculptor, of course. After that, he didn't do as much architecture. So he was it was jealousy. There's no question there was, you know, anger and jealousy on his side, not from Borromini to Bernini, but the other way around. And so I see it as a contributing factor, but there are people who dispute that. Okay, any other questions about uh, your papers? Uh, of course, you can email me or send me a sample of what you've written as long as you don't wait till the day before it's due. But if you do that as, as recently as, or as late as Monday at the latest, that'll give me enough time to get back to you. If uh, I see that you're missing something, I can tell you that if you send it to me as a PDF. Um, but you can also email me individually with just specific questions, of course, at any time. Anybody have any questions now about your papers or about today's lecture or extra credit? I will give you one thing. There is a series called uh, The, the uh, Power of Art by Simon Shima. I think it's S-H-I-M-A. You could look him up pretty easily. The Power of Art, and it is a an eight episode. There's one episode on each artist, and he has one on Bernini, and when you see that, you realize Bernini was a nasty character. He actually disfigured a woman who uh, dared to date his brother and things like that uh, with a knife and got away with it. So he was he was already a pretty vengeful person before Borromini came into the picture. So that's why I say to me, it's pretty clear there's some culpability there. But they, they talk about the rivalry between the two of them in that uh, series. He's a British art historian. I think he just passed away out of the University of London. The power of art, and he, he covers all the way up into Picasso, going all the way back from, I think it's Michelangelo. It's called The Power of Art. It's a superb series. If you watch any of those and write a two page paper about what you learned on any one episode, you get 10 points for extra credit. Okay, anybody else with any questions now about your, again, your papers or uh, any slides? we covered don't forget this if you miss some of you join late the first slide or two the whole thing of course will be posted by 8 p.m on friday on youtube all right um this is your chance if anyone has any important questions or anything you need to you know clarify okay because uh, I, I will check my email but on weekends i, I gotta tell you it's mostly family time so i don't always get back to people right away if you email me late friday night you might not hear from me till sunday night okay i think is that it now for everybody anybody else one last call now anybody have any questions you need to ask all right i think we had a successful session thank you all and uh so one week from today, I look forward to seeing your papers. And on Monday, we'll finish Baroque art and uh, talk about the exam. Okay. Thank All you. right. Bye. You got Bye. It. Have a good week. Thanks. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.